Folks, I want to call the meeting to order. This is a uh, regularly scheduled Greer City Council meeting called and convened this evening, February 11th, uh, 2020. Having called the meeting to order, I'd like to ask um, Troop 603 to stand. Six, uh, troop 603 is from the Grace Methodist Church, and their troop leader is Mrs. Grayson. Uh, young men, if you would, if y'all would like to uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, we will stand. And then following the Pledge of Allegiance, our invocation for council would be led by Council Member Judy Howard. Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for the many blessings that you shed upon us each day. We thank you for our city, and we pray, dear Lord Jesus, that you will bless our city, our state, and our nation. We pray that you will be with us through this meeting, that you will guide and direct us as we go. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate uh, you leading us in uh, the pledge this evening, and um, thank you for what you all do for our community. We know that uh, scouting is a uh, program that uh, not only will uh, help you in terms of leadership skills, but uh, also our community as well. And so I salute you for joining the scouting program and hope you all will stick with it as you grow older. And uh, Ms. Grayson, we thank you for uh, your time and leadership for this young group, this group of young men. So thank you. We appreciate it. Council and Public Forum this evening, we have a number of people that are uh, signed up. And uh, so we will uh, move on to Public Forum. Public Forum, as you know, uh, is the time of meeting we set aside for citizens of the city to come before uh, us and uh, bring items of interest uh, particularly relevant to uh, the agenda in regards to the um, um, uh, items uh, therefore and uh, so this evening we have a number of folks given that we do I would like to ask that uh, you be uh, cognizant of the amount of time that you speak so that others will uh, have an equal amount of time uh, we like comments to be held uh, to at least uh, or to a, a maximum of three minutes, if uh, possible, particularly if someone has already made a point that uh, you would like to make. Uh, I will uh, call the names in order that they're written down. Uh, when your name is called, if you would, make your way to the podium. Uh, as you start, if you will give us your name and address for a matter of the record, we would appreciate it. And Barbara? Uh, Blanton is the first one to speak this evening. I'm Barbara Blanton. My address is 236 Watercourse Way in Greer. I don't like public speaking. I'm sorry I'm first. <laughs> but we are very concerned about the annexation, the proposed annexation into O'Neill Village. The clear cutting of that land has resulted in a great deal of runoff. We had heavy rains last week. They were using bobcats to scrape the roads. If you look, that area runs into Lakes Robinson, or Lakes Cunningham and Robinson, which are part of our water supply. Um, last meeting, Mr. Randolph referred to those land, that land he cleared as just pines. And that's not just poison ivy. That's, that's an area that, you know, certainly held the water or held the land, provided habitat and all like that. He also said that the area needed a restaurant. I've been a poll manager in this precinct at almost every election for the last several years. No one has ever, as people talk and waiting in line, no one has ever said, sure need a restaurant on that parcel of land. They have talked about the uncontrolled growth, the concerns with the roads, O'Neill Road, O'Neill Church is a very small road. It opens onto 101 on a blind hill. And 
this area cannot s support what they're expected to do. Um, they are talking, I know the entire area is 14 acres. He wants to put 120 townhouses and 15,000 feet square feet of commercial. His current commercial has never been full. He does have some more moving <coughs> in. It is an expansion of the daycare. It is the property management group that covers that area, and the other person in there now is one of the builders. Um, I'm going to use a word picture because that works for me. If you and I have 10 cookies between us, the math would say that we have five cookies each because 10 cookies divided by two is five. If I have nine of those cookies and you have one, I can tell you all day that the math says we each have five cookies. But we know we don't. I have nine, you've got one. They're saying when they talk about this expansion that the density will be five to six units per acre. 120 units on 10 to 12 acres is not five to six acre, uh, units per acre. It's 10 to 12 units per acre. And since everybody who comes before the Planning Commission, or at least the developers who come in asking for annexation into Greer, they're not coming wanting to enhance the area. They're coming because they want sewer. And sewer equals density. And if we're looking at that parcel of land of 12 acres, and we're talking sewer, we're looking at two and a half bathrooms per unit. You're looking at 360 toilets going in on that part of the land. Um, I know that people can sell their land and they can develop it, but there's an immense difference between allowing 120 units of townhouses in a very rural area than allowing one house per one or two acres or one house per acre. This is a beautiful area. You drive out 101, you see the mountains, you see the fields, and if you just allow the unmitigated growth without any sort of control, you look at all around our area, we're getting clear cut. You know, we live in a house, we've been up here seven years from Charleston. We live in a house that was built seven years ago in a neighborhood. We are surrounded by trees, we have deer, we have birds, we have foxes, we have squirrels. Um, but there is no need just because a developer comes before you and says they want to do this, that it has to be allowed. As this, many of the large land owners in the area are getting texts and phone calls, multiple ones per week, wanting to buy their land. And it's becoming more and more difficult for someone who maybe wants to buy the land to preserve it because the price is being pushed up by the developmental pressure. So this is the legacy that you will leave if this area is, continues to be beautiful, that will be your legacy. If people drive through here and can't tell if they're at Woodruff Road and at Five Forks, that will be your legacy. But they're not making any more land like this. And to put 120 units on this small area of land, just it's, it's not considered development, it's slash and burn development. And there's just no need for that here. Oh, and I was hoping Mr. Martin would be here. He was quoted in the um, paper on Greenville News on February 5th concerning the new plan at Victor Mill. And he said he expressed concern at that point that here's an area downtown that was changing from um, townhouses to apartments. And he described the new proposal, well, he said it was detrimental it would have a detrimental effect on the property surrounding the site. This will have a detrimental effect on our properties. And a lot of people are here because they care about that. So thank you. Uh, John Blanton. My name is John Blanton. I also reside at 236 Watercourse Way. Um, as my wife previously stated, we've lived here about seven years. We retired up here from Charleston 
I was a senior property appraiser for the Charleston County Assessor's Office for 30 some odd years. So I have firsthand knowledge of how properties go. Our primary concern is 120 townhouses on, they're saying 14 acres of land, but assuming that two and a half acres of the frontage on 101 is for the commercial area, you're now looking at 12 and a half acres of townhouses. That basically equates to about 11 and a half houses, townhouses per acre. When you look at the properties immediately surrounding this, excepting O'Neill Village, obviously, you're looking at houses that are sitting on half acre sites, or you're seeing properties that are big acreages, where farming is still going on. Mr. Few owns several fields up there. He grows soybeans every year. What I would like to help y'all maybe understand is when you have 120 townhouses, assuming two, house, two cars or more per townhouse, you're looking at 360 cars additional and their only entrance is coming off of um, O'Neill Church Road. Now O'Neill Church Road is a tiny little two-lane road to me, it's in fair condition at best. You throw 360 more cars on that daily, that road is going to deteriorate and become pothole capital of the world. That little road also has two terminuses, one on Highway 101, which you come down a hill to get to it. The other end is at Mays Bridge Road, coming out fairly close to Lake Robinson, where the uh, boat landing is. Neither one of those roads at present are currently set up to handle the traffic that this type of development is going to incur. Furthermore, in what we observed, there's no plan in place with this development providing property or maybe the widening of 101 or the widening of the intersection to account for turn lanes. So you imagine people trying to get out of two exits onto one onto O'Neill Church Road in the morning for rush hour. People are going to be stuck in the subdivision. They won't even be able to get to the road to get out. So you're creating a nightmare out here for people who have, in many cases, grown up, brought their children up, and now you're going to turn it into a parking lot, literally. The next item I'd like to think about is this type of development, I think, would work well if it was in downtown Greer or if it was right adjacent to Wade Hampton Boulevard, where you've got plenty of infrastructure, if you will, for moving traffic around. The roads we're talking about, I mean, when they put the stop sign in at Milford Church, you can get there at 7.30 in the morning and that three quarters of an acre of road traffic will be backed up. You'll have 40 cars in line trying to get through that traffic sign. And that's before you get anywhere close to Wade Hampton. You add 300 or so more cars into that mix, and you're going to create a logistical nightmare. It just isn't going to work. So I guess my concern in summary is that the density that is being requested here is not a good use for this property. For the developer, yes. I mean, he can just see his checkbook getting stacked up nicely with people and money. 
But what happens to those 120 townhouses? What precludes that from becoming an apartment complex? There are no apartment complexes out in our end of the world out there. You're creating um, just a huge distraction from the beauty and all of the area out there if it becomes an apartment complex. So I just would ask y'all to please think in terms of the people who have lived there, invested there, in terms of before you make your final decision on this. I just think this is a bad precedent to start putting 120 houses on a 40, on a, a 10 acre piece of land. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, sir. Sue Ellen McConnell. I'm Sue Ellen McConnell, and I live at 519 Kingsbridge Road. That is Taylor's. However, um, the development does affect my area. Um, most of what I plan to say has already been said. One thing, as a former educator, um, I do want to point out, you've got 120 townhouses. You've got one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe many more children in those townhomes. And you've got to look at the school situation. Like I said, as a former educator, um, I know from whence I speak, portables are not a good idea and that is what my view um, my thought is gonna, this is what's going to happen whether the kids are going to be in the Blue Ridge schools or the Greer schools um, we talk about the rain that we had this past week and you think about your little five-year-old in a kindergarten class and the rain is going down and that child has to go to the bathroom. You're going to send that child out. They have to go from the portable to the cafeteria. It's not a good situation. It's a really bad situation. I've had to deal with that in the past when I did teach elementary. It's not a good situation in high school because things that shouldn't happen can happen when you leave the portable and go into um, uh, the building unsupervised. Um, the O'Neill Village that is in place now, I drive by it every day and the uh, lack of landscaping has made one side of the hill on the commercial side just a massive runoff and wash. It's um, running down and forming little creeks and things and it is uh, grossly disturbing wildlife. So from an environmental standpoint, this is not a good thing at all. You have to remember, once it's gone, it's gone. And they're not going to plow up parking lots to bring it back. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Richard Arch. <clears throat> Hello, Richard Arch, 28 Mandarin Circle, also on Taylor's. And uh, I agree with what's been said here, so I'll try not to repeat that. But uh, first, I'd like to say I was back and forth with uh, Brandon McMahon after the last hearing, and Brandon spent a lot of time talking to me. Uh, so I appreciate the openness uh, of the way that the city of Greer is doing this business, but I still don't support what's going on here. Uh, at that uh, November Planning Commission meeting, a bunch of people spoke. The only one that spoke, that spoke in support of this development was the developer. Everybody else said exactly what you're hearing um, right here. Um, 
Nobody in O'Neill Village, nobody around this place wants to see that development. Um, based upon what we've seen with the other property in development, if they annex that land, they will strip it. Um, I think we saw enough mud last week to tell us that that's a bad idea. Um, we are already suffering from severe runoff problems. Uh, stripping that land will just make it a whole lot worse. Uh, putting more hard surface in the uh, watershed area of this lake is just a really bad idea. Um, I've lived other places. The water quality here right now is really nice. It would be a real shame to mess that up. Um, previous hearing did mention traffic studies. Didn't mention them much about the greater area. Um, I know what happens when these things get out of control. It's out of control at, at uh, Milford Church and 101 right now. People are going to start going over the top of a fuse bridge. They'll be coming down Gross Meadow. Meadow, they'll go anywhere they can. The rest of us are going to suffer from this. Right now, those of us that live on the west side of the lake do not go down to uh, Milford Church and 101 during rush hour because it doesn't work. Um, if this uh, if this if this development is passed, that infrastructure to improve that intersection and the surrounding intersections that are affected should be in place before they're allowed to build anything. Um, O'Neill Village is four and a half miles from the Wade Hampton corridor. All of the services are on uh, Wade Hampton. Um, putting high density developments up there is going to be dragging uh, strip development up those roads from the Wade Hampton area and uh, it's going to go into mostly rural land. Um, the developer made comments during the last hearing how wonderful it was to have a daycare facility on the, on the present site and I'm sure that's true but every one of those people who were dropping off or picking up kids was getting in their cars and driving to their place of employment unless they happened to work uh, in their houses. Um, Last week, I read a, a, uh, a great article in the Wall Street Journal. It's talking about sprawl on uh, Lake Wiley, South Carolina. Uh, that's a Charlotte suburb. And these are the same folks <coughs> in this room that live around here. It was a formerly quiet rural area. People were living there. They were left alone. They didn't want all this high-density sprawl. They got it. The uh, article talks about sprawl, traffic, frustration of home homeowners who cannot enjoy what was previously a quiet rural existence, and now they're all planning to, to ban all new construction. I, these, are, these are amazing things coming out of a little quiet place, just like here. Uh, the parallels of what's happening in Lake Wyland with uh, what's going on in the area north of the Wade Hampton corridor are really hard to miss. Uh, so I urge you to quit developing the rural spaces and focus development in areas of the county that have the infrastructure and the desired support. We love seeing the improvements downtown Greer. Uh, we love seeing this kind of development put into places that are designed to handle it. Um, annexation of this particle, uh, parcel and its planned expansion of O'Neill Village runs counter to the wishes of the residents in this area and should be denied in its present form. Suitable use of that property should benefit the region, not become a contributor to the sprawl that we all wish to avoid. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Sandra Duffy, D-U-F-F-Y, and I live at 110 Glastonbury Drive in Greer, and I live in Autumn Hills. Now where this development is proposed is going to be basically across the street from where I live. And when I first saw this, I thought, nah, somebody's kidding. There's, there's, somebody's going to go, April Fool's, you know, we're just kidding you. This is one of the worst ideas I've ever seen in my life. What everybody's saying 
is the same thing that we said before. Whether anybody heard us or not, I don't know. But if you try to go through the all-way stop, it's impossible. You're stuck there for God knows how long, every day, in the morning and then at night coming home, too. It's not just in the morning, it's at night coming home, too. Um, the, you know, to, to take a piece of land, like what they have, and just strip it of everything is just horrible, just absolutely horrible. You know, yeah, sure, he has the right to sell his property, but why sell it to a developer that's going to rip the house down, take all the trees out, and make it ugly? And that's what O'Neill Village is. It's ugly. Yes, it is. It's one of the ugliest developments I've ever seen. Yes, it is, sir. Don't you point at me. Well, don't you <laughs> shake your head at me. All right. It is an ugly development. The houses, if you stand like this in between your house and the house next door, you can basically touch each other. There's, there's been little landscaping that's been put in there. The commercial development that they have in the front has basically not been used. They, things come and go and come and go all the time there. Um, I, one of the ladies here said something about the, the, uh, where the, the hill is when you're first coming in. It's basically clay now, dirt, red clay. The other day when it rained really bad, I came home from work and I see my neighbors right across the street from me and they're actually, their backyard is gonna back into this development. And they're standing out there, it looked like somebody had dumped pails of water on them. Luckily, they had brought two uh, pumps from up north where they lived. And they had the two pumps going because, and it never happened before, the water was just gushing from back where this development is going to be, over the, down the hill behind them, and down through their property. If they didn't have those pumps, they, they would have been, you know, their, their uh, uh, sunroom on the back of the house would have been like this deep in water. What's gonna happen when these 120 or 125 townhomes are built there, all the parking lots, you know, the cement and everything, where's the water gonna go that comes down the next time we have a gully washer like that? It's gonna come down and it'll probably end up in my yard because I'm right across the street. And all the rest of the homes that are along the way there that are gonna be backed up by this are gonna end up you know, knee deep in water. Why do we need to have this thing? So Greer, the city of Greer can have a little more money. So the developer can have a little more money. They've got a big section that they're still building at O'Neill Village. Finish that first. And then think about where you want to go. This is going to be, you know, a right across, like I said, this is going to be right across the street from me. And it'll be just as ugly as O'Neill Village is. The houses are crowded on each other. My, my house, I bought, I think I moved in there like seven years ago. I'm on 0.68 acres, and I'm on a, on a curve, so then that's why I have it, because we, we're not annexed to Greer, so we have septic systems. And my leach fields come across one, you know, come off of one side of the house, and that's why I've got a little more property there. But generally speaking, the people in Autumn Hills basically have about a half an acre of land that comes with the house. And that's nice because you're not sitting right on top of your neighbor. They're not sitting on top of you. You can plant trees, but landscaping in looks very nice. O'Neill Village, it's horrible. And that monstrosity that they want to build across the street from me is going to be worse. Thank you. Thank you. Frank, the Taurus, the Taurus. My legal name is Francois Sitaras. I was born in France. I, the reason I, I cut it to Frank is because nobody can pronounce Francois. S I T A R C. I live at 3451 O'Neill Church Road. The issue I brought up in the past, which most of these people have already, is the infrastructure. 
the road is very narrow. I saw surveyors the other day, and they went all the way up to the AT&T boxes, which means maybe they're planning to expand this road. They can only go on the opposite side. So if they expand it there, what are you going to do? Tell AT&T to move all your stuff out? And then there was a thing she brought up about wild animals. I look in the, on my phone and I was like, is anybody missing two cows? How on earth can you be missing two cows? I mean, you don't run. I go like, you got to be kidding me. I said, does Greer run a homeless shelter for animals? I mean, we're knocking everything down, guys. You know? You think Greenville is beautiful? I don't. Hartford, when I was a kid, was beautiful. You go there now, you'd be shaking your head and going like, what the heck happened here? Don't let that happen to Greer. And the biggest thing I have is I want more police, more fire protection. We're very fortunate because we have the Cunningham Fire Department. <clears throat> Excuse me. From what I heard is they took out the ambulance service. They moved them somewhere else. Bottom line is, if you got a problem, how long is it going to take for the police or the fire department to respond? I, I went to Ingalls, which is on 290, which is off of North Rutherford, and there was a, a guy banged into somebody. I went in there for like, I must have been there half an hour. I come back there, there's still no police there. Now, I'm not, but you know something, it's going to be hard to find cops now because everybody's shooting them. I don't, I don't know what the problem is. I have no clue. I was always taught to respect them and the things that hurts my feelings. But the bottom line is we need more cops. We need more uh, fire department and we need more. Look at all the homes you're building. Everywhere you go, there's this home, this home, there's little... These guys can't respond to everything. And the ambulance service can't respond to everything. And a lady brought up a good point about the schools. You're going to have 120 townhouses? Okay. That's average. is two cars per house. Average. Now, I was told by the developer who's here, by the way, he came to our house, and bottom line is they can't exit onto 101. Well, 101 is a nightmare anyway, because I come down, I go to the dump, which is right down the road. And things, if you try to make a left-hand turn, there's a hill there. Now, with that hill, you don't see the cars coming, and they're usually going at a good clip, which, okay, I can see that. But the bottom line is, better time it pretty good. That's all I'm going to say. And, Bottom line is the police, the fire, and the infrastructure. You know, they want to widen the road. What are you going to tell AT&T? You got to move your boxes? They should widen it the whole length if they're going to do that because we have the, the cement trucks coming because they're building, uh, what is it, uh, four and five or whatever. I guess we're three. But uh, four and five, they haven't got those built yet. And the dirt's running off into other people's property when it rains. I mean, unfortunately, we had that heavy rain, but that's not my fault, you know. But the bottom line is, guys, let's keep it quaint, keep it nice the way, it, yes, you can build rooms, but just remember, you need cops. You gotta have them, because who are you gonna call when you have a problem? You're gonna call a cop, you're gonna call a fireman, fire department, you can call 911, but they can only respond to what people you know, as fast as they have people available to respond. So that's one of my biggest things. I think most of the people hit on the other topics pretty well. And uh, but the thing is, the infrastructure. And like I said, we got a it's on a novelty drive. It's a it's I guess a containment pond. I have never seen one that full. Normally, I've never seen it that full. I've been here two years. It was up to the top. I was going like. Jesus, I told my wife, I go, Nancy, look at this. I was going like, but that's about it, guys. I just, guys, just keep this quiet. That's all. Keep it the way it should be. Greer is a beautiful town. You got a lot of old buildings in there. Don't knock everything down. <laughs> Fix them. Because, you know, some half the material in them is probably better than the stuff you're going to buy at Home Depot anyway. Trust me, I have a house. By Crescent Homes. And somebody here inspected it and gave it the certificate of occupancy. So my wife called them and asked them about the stairs in the back. When you open the, the door, 
you stepped out, you fell down the stairs. There was no landing. I go like, how do you prove that? Whatever. We won't go into the stop sign on the 101 because that's another. I've gone down there and I'm backed up all the way to the Cunningham Fire Department, waiting to make that stop sign. So I avoided all these other people. That's all I got to say, folks. Thank you, sir. We need police. Thank you very much, folks. Paula Herring. Hello. So my name is Paula Herring, and I live at 2 Perkins Court, Greer, 29651. Um, I also um, work at Crespi Elementary, which is here in Greer, and um, I would prefer not. I would prefer not to have 120 townhomes on the corner of O'Neill and Highway 101. I do live on this in the subdivision right behind it, and um, I believe that 120 townhomes would be way. Um, way too much for that spot. As we did see this Thursday and Friday, there's a water runoff and there's flooding in this location. An extra community on a lot of 12 acres or less, it would, with that, with 120 townhomes there, it would increase the water runoff and the flooding as well. There on the corner of Highway 101 and O'Neill Church. The water coming from O'Neill Church going towards the lake there at the intersection, it's pretty flooded. And I've noticed quite some time people will try to avoid it, but it takes up a full lane, so it's a little difficult. Anyhow, um, I just think that it would affect our families and our friends and a lot of people here in this room. I know you all have grandkids with kids, friends, and a few boys and different people here have uh, children who this would also affect in the sense of um, me working in Crestview Elementary, like I mentioned earlier. We had a we had a council school day on Friday due to the weather due to, to due to the weather and the road conditions. Out in Blue Ridge, that's where uh, this spot is located. It's technically considered Blue Ridge, even though it's rear, due to the fact that our kids go to uh, Blue Ridge Middle and Blue Ridge High School. I have my Blue Ridge earrings on. And uh, this would really affect the area. I'm not used to speaking in um, council meetings like this, so excuse my voice if I sound a little shaky. But uh, we did have to cancel. We did have to cancel this uh, last Friday day of school. We had um, road conditions with the weather that flooded specific areas and uh, the water accumulation on different areas caused um, erosion and floods. It affected close friends of mine and, um, and it affected our kids not being able to go to school. So in that aspect, it affected their education. I know we have snow days that allow for this, but uh, we only have, I believe, three snow days that we allow. And I don't want it to be any worse than that. The corner of O'Neill and Highway 101 is a nice place to build a clubhouse with a pool, basketball court, and a tennis court. But I do believe that 120 townhomes is a bit too much. So if you all would please reconsider the 120 townhomes, I'd appreciate it. You're welcome. We uh, moved to present. Uh, excuse me. Moved to the uh, minutes of the council meeting from January 28th, 2020. I'll entertain the motion that they be received. Second. 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 Have a motion and a second. Any items submitted to the clerk? Hearing none. Ms. Duncan. Mr. Arrowwood? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Arrowwood? Yes. Mayor Diamond? Yes. 
Council, we have a presentation this evening. The Public Service Department is bringing their annual update to Council. Uh, Mr. Steve Grant, our city engineer, uh, will make the presentation. Four years, sir. Thank you, sir. I would like to point out if I had a couple more patches, I could join this distinguished group here on the. Y'all are similarly dressed in a good company, I think. Um, uh, this is not actually our annual report. This ah, is actually okay. just an update. Um, you've heard of the State of the Union address in the political season. I just wanted to give you a brief statement of uh, State of the Department address. I've been on the new job in the Public Services Department just over five months, and I've gotten a good look at where we are operationally. And uh, I just want to spend some time sharing with you uh, my thoughts. Um, my assessment is, we, uh, in my view, we have um, good, committed people who are willing to do almost anything. We have good equipment in general, but we do have some challenges and significant undertakings that we need to address in the near future, and I just want to spend a couple of minutes running through those with you. Um, if you'll recall, the Engineering and Stormwater Division of Building Development Standards moved over to Public Services, and uh, so this is, the, this is where I started about five years ago. So I'm going to talk about that division first. Um, I first brought up the idea of the Road Improvement Program in 2018, and I'm glad to say today that we do have a line item in the budget for road improvement projects, and currently we have a consultant studying the three roads where we get the most complaints. The results of this study will put us on a path for road improvement projects that we can prioritize and budget for in the next few years. Um, per the MS4 permit, scroll down. Okay, um, we have a partial uh, system map of our storm drain system, and we need to complete it to be in compliance with our MS4 permit. Um, this will be a significant undertaking, and you're likely to hear more about this in the future from Robert Rue, our assistant city engineer. Also, we're going to need to consider a asset management system for roads, sidewalk, storm drain system, curb and gutter, bridges, street signs, and pavement markings. We have a lot of valuable, important infrastructure out there, um, <coughs> and, but we have no idea, uh, other than the pavement, we have no idea what condition a lot of it's in or even how much we have. I'm talking about sidewalks and, and a storm drain system. Um, the good news is, with the pavement data, uh, that we're getting very soon with our pavement program. We're also going to get it, be getting sidewalk and ADA ramp and curb and gutter data that we can use in an asset management system in the future if and when we get one. Moving over to building maintenance, uh, Dan and his team are doing an excellent job overall. They do touch every department in the city and they have plenty of opportunities. Just a couple of things that they'll be working on just, for example, in the near future is replacing concrete deck and railing at the Country Club ball field, the pergola replacement at City Hall, and then some epoxy floor a coating on the floor at Cannon Center. And as the city grows, as a recent development at the Rear Country Club, and our facilities age, the workload in this, in this division is going to increase, and we'll have to monitor these critical systems like roofs and HVA systems and our staffing and budget. And we'll probably need to also consider an asset management system for these systems maybe tied to the, the road and the <coughs> asset management as well. <coughs> On the fleet maintenance uh, side, uh, Terry is managing well by himself. We do have uh, open mechanic position field. We'll be fully staffed by next week in there. Currently, we have individual drivers are responsible for um, keeping up their vehicle maintenance schedule. And this is fine if everybody is consistent and diligent. Uh, right now, we have no way of tracking where any vehicle is in relation to preventive maintenance. If somebody forgets an oil change, there's really no way to know or, or uh, keep up with that. Uh, there's no scheduling system. Most of the drivers just show up at the door. Terry doesn't really know from day to day uh, what's coming in the door. So this is not an ideal situation from scheduling. Um, most of our records are in paper boxes um, for the fleet in the fleet visit, uh, division and many have vague descriptions such as just a vehicle number and it just says service. Um, 
no really done description of what service means. So we need to move toward a better, more detailed system for fleet maintenance. And for illustration, I'm going to tell you a quick story about Truck 22. Truck 22 is a 2016 Ford F-250 diesel that we have. Uh, it developed some engine problems. Uh, was not running well. It was something bigger than Terry could tear down. So we called D&D Ford and asked them, negotiated back and forth on them looking at it and probably an engine tear down to figure out what it was because it was a pretty a big, big issue. Um, the guy said, bring your maintenance records and if, you know, maybe we can work out a cost sharing deal. If it's out of warranty by age, but it was still under warranty, inside the warranty technically by mileage. So we dug around in some boxes and found some surface records for it. And uh, when, when our mechanic got there and talked to him, the guy basically laughed at him and said, this is all you got. It was just couple of sheets of paper that said service on truck 22. No real explanation of what was done. You know, the VIN number wasn't tied to it. Um, so um, we just need to probably look at moving towards a fleet management system that's likely tied to our fuel system. So that segues me over to the fuel system, which is 19 years old. The company that services it says the life expectancy of that system is 15 to 20 years. So we're near the end of the service life of that system, and we should um, consider integrating a fleet fuel management system where we, where when we fuel up, the mileage automatically updates to the fleet uh, system and notifies the driver and the shop um, uh, that service or maintenance is coming due soon. But, uh, we should be able to look at our system and predict or see which vehicles are getting close to needing maintenance. Uh, this would be more effective uh, for scheduling in the shop and it would eliminate missed maintenance and it would provide better details of our completed maintenance work if we get in a situation like we did with Truck 22. Public service team, I would like to say that Ricky, Diane, and Shannon have helped me get up to speed in this group. I've had a lot of questions for them, but uh, they've been more than willing to help get me up to speed with them, so that's been great. Uh, essentially, we have 10 people, public service worker title people, splitting time between multiple duties. Um, if you allow me to indulge for just a second, I'll just want to hit a couple of the highlights. In the fall and winter, they do leaf pickup. In the spring through fall, they do right away mowing, year round pothole repair, sidewalk repair, <coughs> repair, delivering trash carts, cleaning ditches, storm drain pipes, on and on and on. Um, the point being, they're jacks of all trades with no focus on any one thing. They jump around to whatever is needed uh, on that day. I feel like we're in an awkward stage between a small town where a few people did everything and a larger city where you have dedicated teams that focus on certain areas like road repair or sidewalk repair or storm drainage repair. So far we're keeping up, but as we grow, I believe we'll need to transition to dedicated teams um, in the future. For example, I mentioned with the sidewalk evaluation that's coming along with our pavement. Just for instance, we, they find out with the, when we get the results back, we have 15, uh, 15 miles of sidewalk five miles are in good condition, five miles are in fair condition, and five miles are in poor condition. Now all of a sudden we have a program where we can dedicate a team of people to work on these five miles of poor condition sidewalks over the next one, two, three, four years, however we want to budget for it. Uh, it. Um, our current work order system consists of emails, verbal requests, or paper tickets. There's really no official way to keep up with or track all the requests we receive. They're mostly kept in a notebook that Ricky keeps, and we dig the notebook out for the monthly report and the yearly report. So, but if anything ever happened to that notebook, we have no record of really where we've worked in the past. Um, so if we had a workforce system, that would allow us to better document requests, plan, schedule, and track costs, and also report on the progress of all the requests we get. Move over to solid waste. Um, the compact with recycle centers in poor condition. Um, it is costing us a little extra money uh, for solid waste right now because it's not efficient. Um, so we're having to use other opportunities to handle our volume. Uh, Mike and I have met recently with a solid waste consultant. Kind of got like a big picture view of our operation, you know, the number of customers, the cost, that kind of stuff. Um, they give us reports that suggested things we could consider in our next contract and things we could, should consider operationally down the road. Um, we need to update our transfer station permit capacity. Right now we're collecting about 1,000 tons per month, which is about 12,000 a year, and, and our facility is actually only permitted for 9,600 tons per year, so we need to update our permit uh, per DHEC. 
and we've recently been partnering with ACE to better track and resolve complaints. So hopefully that'll pay some dividends in the near future. So in summary, on the good side, we do have good solid people who are capable and willing to work, and we have some good equipment. Um, on the not so good side, we need to get into the 21st century with our work management systems. And with those, we can complete our storm drain system map. We can move toward an asset management system for all our critical infrastructure, a fleet and fuel management system for our fleet, and a work order system for all our people and their work. And then we should review our solid waste operations and operations for the future. Now, I know these, all these items, priorities, timing, and budget are certainly unknown right now, but I will be working with administration in the next few weeks and months to discuss some of this and, and, and have a plan to move forward. That's really all I have. I just like this. Kind of the State of the Department, my view after five months on the job. Uh, any questions? Council? On the equipment, you know, I've talked about the uh, being able to uh, I guess utilize equipment that has more than one function. Uh, if, if you are if you're looking at things like that, for instance, I know there's equipment out there that will operate a, like a, a rotary cutter on the moon, um, and then it can operate other things. You know, you know, it's it is a piece of equipment that is having a, a rubber tire tractor operating a rotary cutter. This could actually, you know. I mean, are you looking at things like that? I'm not selling one thing or another. Um, I wouldn't say specifically at the moment looking at anything like that. I guess what kind of goes along with that is, like I said, we have a lot of good equipment. I mean, we have a lot of good equipment, really good equipment, and a lot of it. We just don't have a lot of people that can operate. And like I said, they move to the street stuff one week, and then we own the concrete stuff one day, and then you know, the flood events, and we're blocking roads the next day. So it's just... The crew just kind of jump around and use whatever we need for that day or that week. So is the most critical need uh, labor? Well, it depends on when we get all these uh, facility assessments back, like with the sidewalk and the ADA. I mean, we'll have a, then we'll be able to kind of get our hands around what we really have in our storm drain network. I mean, we could, if we have 10 miles of storm drain system, I mean, we don't really know what condition it's in right now. We could be sitting on a half a million dollars worth of storm drain improvement projects that we, just don't, even, we don't even know right now. You know, it's kind of ignorance is bliss. We're just basically reactive. We don't, we're not proactively inspecting the system or looking at where work is needed or prioritizing or anything like that. Like I said, I think we're just, Greer's come a long way from a small town with, like I said, a few people doing everything to now we've got, we're a larger town with big town problems and growth and, um, I don't think our staffing is quite to that level yet, or our, our, our work management system to help us manage that infrastructure. Speaking of work management um, and infrastructure on the fleet, it, it, that, that's something I'll be very simple to uh, attach to because it's all sound like generator, right? I mean, it's, or is that something that's going to be, because I know that on a couple of our trucks we have. That they're newer trucks, but we have a tracking system, right? And you can you can look where anywhere you want to and find it from anywhere you want to look, see where that vehicle is, see right. where maintenance, right? If there's issues. Well, a little bit I've looked at, yeah. There's yeah systems that track. You can look on the screen and see where all your vehicles are that day or that minute. Uh, all that stuff. I'm not sure how in depth we're going to get towards that, but I mean certainly that's all on the table. So. Others? Thank, thank you, sir. We appreciate the thank update you. and the information and uh, for your efforts in that regard. It's, uh, I know, um, handling the responsibilities of, of, of that department and uh, trying to make um, decisions about the future have uh, kept you busy. So thank you for pulling this together for us. We will uh, move to the administrator's report. Mr. Driggers. Thank you, sir. Uh, most importantly, I want to remind you of uh, your planning retreat, which is scheduled next Tuesday and Wednesday, February 18th and 19th. Uh, we've been able to include all of the topic items that you've uh, requested us to include in that, a number of other issues that we know that we need to spend some time on. 
Uh, it is a very full day on Tuesday and as well equally as full on Wednesday. Uh, I've sent some information to you earlier today uh, concerning times and location. Uh, we'll have some additional information coming to you by the end of the week as well. Uh, so you'll have some some uh, reading assignment a bit over the weekend as you prepare for Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. But looking forward to that time with you uh, next week. Uh, we did close on the golf course property last week, uh, so we now are uh, the official owners of the Greer Golf and Country Club. I uh, had an opportunity to go out and meet with employees there. Um, we, we closed on Thursday afternoon, and I met with them about an hour or so after that closing. Uh, so I had a really good opportunity to spend some time there. I uh, spent a big part of the day on Friday actually on site at the facility uh, working with personnel out there. Uh, so we're continuing to move forward. Uh, we are now currently under an operational agreement. Uh, with the uh, with, with the, the course that was there in place, uh, and uh, we're excited about the opportunities that we have uh, to start programming uh, that facility as part of uh, Greer's newest park. Uh, looking forward to that. Relative to our Synergy project, uh, as you can only imagine, uh, the weather uh, has, is creating a number of issues for us. Uh, all of our work is in the wet. Uh, and that makes that extremely challenging for us uh, at this time. Uh, but we are continuing to move forward. We're using all resources uh, that we can, uh, and we do our best to keep dodging uh, the, the rain as it comes down. Uh, but once the, uh, the wet weather moves out for us, we'll be able to get back on schedule and moving forward. Uh, every opportunity that Sossaman has uh, when it's dry, or at least when it's not raining, uh, it's not dry by any stretch of the imagination, but when it's not raining, uh, we are continuing uh, through their resources to have folks out there. Uh, so you may you may get a few questions from some folks that are asking why a couple of things may be taking a little bit longer. It's a weather delay. Uh, and so we're, we're working with that to the best of our ability, and certainly Sossaman uh, and their team is doing everything that they can. Uh, and we're, we're still not behind schedule. We're still uh, actually a little bit ahead of schedule, but the rain did eat into that a bit. So uh, we are looking forward to moving forward. Um, July 10th, I think I mentioned that to you before, but that's a date that we want to go ahead and place on our calendars. Uh, we will actually be uh, uh, hosting a block party uh, on Trade Street and in the entire downtown area. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to cut the ribbon and dedicate uh, the new facility, uh, our, again, at that point, which will, again, be our newest park. Uh, so we will dedicate that on Friday, July the 10th, and we'll have more information coming to you on that. But we are starting the programming process uh, of that block party to introduce uh, all of our community uh, to, to that new environment that's downtown. Looking forward to that. That's the only information I have at this point. I'm certainly glad to answer any questions that you may have uh, or our staff is present. Thank you, Thank sir. You. As always, the administrator and department heads will be glad to uh, answer any questions uh, that you may have in regards uh, not only to his report, but uh, to updates in regards to the various different departments. We'll move on to appointments of boards and commission. The planning commission uh, has an opening in District 3. Uh, Mr. Hopper has joined us here on the council and uh, left an opening uh, on the planning commission. Any update in regards to filling that position, sir? Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, updated you last meeting that I had spoken to a candidate who is considering that opportunity. Um, that candidate has tentatively said yes, but is undergoing a job transition that they are starting a job on Monday, the 17th of this month, which is actually the next Planning Commission meeting. And so he has requested of me just a, another week or two just to make that transition, double check, make sure that no travel demands will you know, keep him from serving appropriately on the commission, but we should have his name to put forward very soon. Thank you, sir. We have another opening in the Recreation Association on their Board of Trustees. Uh, District 4, Wayne Yonk has resigned effectively 1-31-2020. Uh, his term was set to expire on 12-31-2021. Um, that um, leaves an opening for District 4. So um, we will look for you for some direction in that regard. Yes, I'll have an appointment for the next meeting. Thank you, sir. 
With that then, Council, we move to items of old business. First of which is um, second and final reading of ordinance number 42 2019. This is an ordinance provided for the annexation of properties owned by Willie Canada, William Canada, Bruce Canada, and Eric Canada, and to William and Tamla Canada, Ronald and Nancy Mason, located at 3468-3472-3541 O'Neill Church Road by 100% petition and to establish a zoning classification of TD for said property. Mr. McMahon, any new information, updates, or information in regards to the second and final reading of Ordinance Number 42-2019? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This honor request went before Planning Commission on November 18th. Um, at this meeting, Planning Commission made a recommendation for approval with a few changes to the original site plan. They wanted a mix of single-family duplexes and townhomes to kind of reflect what was going on in the bigger part of O'Neill Village, since this was going to be incorporated with the entire development. Um, staff is requesting to amend Exhibit E and F, which is the statement of intent and site plan for this project. That can originally requested um, 120 watts has reduced that to 113 watts. This here is the property in question along O'Neill Church and Highway 101, um, along with the 15,000 square feet of commercial space. This reduction to the site plan and to the statement of intent will allow for O'Neill uh, village to develop 708 lots for the entire development, which is roughly 3.5 units per acre. Um, this amendment is a part of your ordinance tonight. This is the site plan. <coughs> Along the right here, these were original homes. These will now be single-family homes. They're all rear-loaded. <coughs> all will come off the building road. These kind of bigger squares here. These are duplexes. He currently has these in the Uno Village section right now as being developed. So Planning Commission just wanted to kind of mirror what was going on in that development. Um, this is all the information that I have at this time, but we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, sir. For the purpose of discussion, I want to take a motion to receive. Seven. And a second. second. Floor is open for discussion. Tonight and uh, over, we, we, we hear the same things every time there's a, there's a growth of, and it's uh, there's a few things that I would hope that staff eventually can just put together a handout for things that we do and that we don't allow. Um, when there's a large, and I'm, I'm going to take just a second and kind of speak to some of the folks that are out there that came tonight, one of the concerns was clear cutting. Yeah, you've got to take out trees, but we also require a tree survey and for so many trees that are removed that based on their size, more trees are required. Um, runoff, and I see you shaking your head, but that's not, that, that is, that is fact. Uh, then we um, also, um, everybody's mentioning the flood, and that was an event that, that is uh, prob probably in the neighborhood of a 50 or 100 year event. However, all development is uh, required to have retainage of the water no greater than it was prior to the development. So that's, there, there's several other things, that, and Brandon can fill you in on it, of things that, that we do. We also meet with school district uh, about uh, impact on schools. We, uh, EMS, everybody's invited to one big meeting to say, hey, is this going, is this going to happen? And Brandon, would you bring up that slide prior here that where you have the circle? Yes, sir. I've also heard about uh, in the mornings and in the evenings traffic backed up. Well, folks, you're not unique. Everywhere in Greenville County and probably the upstate, in the morning and in the evening, you're backed up at intersections. Um, that is because we are we are thankfully in an area of the country that has uh, good workers, good education, and we have a lot of good jobs to offer, and so that attracts a lot of people. Um, the road situation, I'll agree with you. you. You know, our state is way behind on Highway 101. M most of the roads you probably travel on are, are not city roads. They're probably state roads. Um, 
the other, and, and this this is uh, one other thing that I did here was about stopping sprawl. I agree with that. That's a hundred percent agree on, on in Jay's perfect world. We don't need sprawl. And dense development is the way you stop sprawl. And I see a few people giggling, but I'll make my point. People said I live on large lots because I have a septic tank. That made your subdivision larger. It also made you, uh, you're discharging uh, untreated sewage into the ground. Um, inside uh, the, the city, all of our sewage is collected and treated. We don't have any, um, we, do, we don't have massive runoff from any of our sites that's going into Lake Cunningham or Lake Robinson. And then when you look all around that picture there, what is highlighted is the city limits. But I look around and see all these other subdivisions that aren't in the city. So who, who said, I'm the last one here, I'm turning the lights off? Who gave, who gave you that authority to do that? You talked about farmland. There's one farmer up there now, I, because I've lived here all my life. And that, that land has been with the Jews forever and a day. There used to be a lot of other farmers. But the problem is, the highest and best use for the land now is not agriculture use. It's what you're seeing. Growth is going to happen without the city. But I will warn you that if you don't try to manage the growth, you will be looking at an Atlanta. That, that, that it, and growth is, hap growth is going to happen whether, whether we're here or not. I, I think there's another point to be made in regards to that, to that conversation. One of the things that, that we try and do, um, have tried to do, and I think do a very successful job of doing it because this isn't the only rural area uh, that we've got growth going on in the city of Abner Creek area, for example, is probably even more rural than this area is. Um, and, there's, and there's a fair bit of development going on as, as well there. Um, this particular council, or at least the ones that have been on any length of time, um, have engaged in a very intentional um, effort to uh, help prevent sprawl. And, and part of that comes from density and uh, infill. And that's one of the things that has been a tenet of, of our efforts in terms of, of planning and zoning and, and uh, how we handle things is to offer a variety of products uh, within areas so that there are opportunities for uh, folks to in, in enjoy the lifestyle that, uh, that they would like to lead in, in an area that they'd like to live in. And uh, certainly that is driven in some regard by, by schools and churches and uh, access to amenities and um, to, to jobs and that sort of thing. Uh, it, it, it behooves me at this point to say that while we do uh, what I think is an admirable job of, of planning and planning for development, uh, it is discouraging sometimes when when those efforts are not supported by those areas around us. And uh, that's just a difference in philosophy between the counties and, and the municipalities. Um, we still live in a very rural part of the state. Um, we, we also uh, exist in a, a county uh, that is uh, still a rural county. And that's reflected in the fact that you don't see subdivision regulations and, and other things that uh, tell people how they can or can't develop their property. And so consequently, it's, uh, it's, it's a better situation maybe than what you would find in Spartanburg, uh, but in some parts of the county, uh, you might have your ideal home um, and piece of land and find yourself next door to a mobile home one day as opposed to, to townhomes. And um, so one of the things that I would urge people to do is to uh, to, to take a look closely at how the, how the, county, the county is handling development and uh, what applications they have or don't have. I will admit as well, too, it has been particularly frustrating to me that efforts uh, by 
by others to improve this area, particularly in regards to the road, have been rebuffed by uh, that area. Uh, I serve on the GPAS committee. Uh, we have sought funding for years to improve the intersection down at the fire department. And uh, with the help of SCDOT, had a plan to, uh, to put a roundabout in there to eliminate the stop signs. And um, there was uh, such a uh, uh, overture of displeasure about the road improvements in that area uh, that that now is now off the table. And so um, an opportunity, I think, a, a great opportunity to do road improvement in that area and to address a situation that many of you have uh, addressed tonight. Um, quite possibly we'll get no funding whatsoever. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe an improved intersection right there, or at least, you know, more signage, but it's not going to, it's not going to leave a problem that could have been alleviated uh, through good design and, and through something that uh, is a new and different idea, uh, just like what we're doing here. And uh, so um, I would, uh, I would urge you, there is a, there's much more to play than what's going on here. It's, uh, we, we, we deal with the state. Uh, we deal with the county uh, in, in the city, and um, we feel like we're doing as a good a job as we can in terms of trying to determine where growth goes and, and what it looks like, and uh, hopefully what the finished product is. Others? I did see it mentioned that they had requested a traffic study. Was that traffic study done, Brandon? We have not received a traffic study yet. We will have that before this goes back to planning condition for a final development plan, and that will have the recommendations of improvements along Odell Church and along Highway 101. Typically with traffic studies, DOT requires basically a quarter mile distance to study. They don't require the entire road. That's, in, that's just DOT's policy because they can't really affect or control too much outside of that area because of the development. Um, we met with DOT about this. I mean, they are pretty good about reviewing traffic studies. We also require a traffic study also, and we will have that reviewed in-house also with recommendations. Um, I believe the developer did mention at the public hearing that he has set aside some funding for improvements at that intersection. So if that were to come about, there is some money set aside that is already set aside for him to get those improvements done. Um, you brought up a good point, Mayor. Um, Campbell County just completed their comprehensive plan. Um, when reviewing that plan and kind of looking at that area since it is outside of the city limits currently, the density that they have out there they're requ or recommending is two and a half to three units per acre. So this development is only a half a unit more in density. Um, so it's compatible. Greenville County came to that meeting. They had no qualms about this development at all. Others? I just have one other question. I know you mentioned townhomes, and then there was a mention about duplexes. Yes, ma'am. So with the duplexes, are, are they going to be sold? Are they ready? They will all, this will be a for sale product. Uh -huh. um, they currently have these in Uno Village. If you actually drive by them, you cannot really tell they're duplexes. They look basically like single, they're single family homes attached for the most part, but they're just the way they're set up. It's just considered a duplex. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I was just wondering why it wasn't termed a townhome as well, uh, rather than a duplex or something. Duplex does sound like a rented piece of property as opposed to townhome. Mm -hmm. Mr. Magdalene, is this? It sounded like the Planning Commission kind of gave a little bit of pushback on the amount of units and they were asking if it was comparable to the existing development. I mean, what is the existing mix as far as single family houses versus townhouses? You know, if it's like a one to one ratio or two to one or how? how um, is the ratio is a little bit high. I mean, the majority of it is single family. They are starting to transition some of those into kind of as they get into the further phases. I believe now they're starting with phase four. I believe they're starting phase four, so now they're starting to ramp up a little more townhomes in those sections. I believe currently they have roughly 28 developed. I think they have 25 more on the books right now. They're starting. Um, there's not a really good answer because they do have some duplexes in there also, so I can't give you an exact answer of the ratio. I think this is a similar situation that we ran into the development that was across the Chestnut Hills plantation. I remember uh, the developer came to us a while back and there was a good bit of pushback from the community about the density and I remember um, we made some compromises with the green space and, and shifted the 
the makeup of the development to more uh, to more closely mask that area. And I, so you, you talked about the changes that were made and then the amount of units per acre. Uh, how did the changes impact that number? What what did you say it was? Was it? Um, they originally requested 120. Right now, it was 120 townhomes with 15,000 square feet of commercial. There are now on their site plan they have before you tonight. It's 98 townhomes, six attached. They refer to them as twin homes, um, and then nine single-family homes, which will line Oak Hill Church Road. So they did reduce it down roughly, I believe, seven units. But this mirrors basically what they're doing in O'Neill Village for the most part. I think it does, but it doesn't. I mean, I think that a lot, most of O'Neill Village, and I don't know the exact ratio, back to my initial question, I, I think that there's more single family homes, and I think the townhomes were, they weren't an afterthought, but I think it was part of the overall project, and I think they were, the intent was for them to be mixed in, and, and uh, you know, it would be more like a one, almost a one to one or two to one ratio, and this, this does seem a little out of, out of balance if you, if you think about it from that perspective. If you go back to the original intent of the developer, um, this is something that the cities want because it's considered, um, I guess, the very traditional type of neighborhoods when you go back and look at municipalities and the way things were developed. You have mixed use, which is commercial and several types of residential. Uh, you have, um, you have, uh, Either very limited lot space, or no, or no lot lines where there's lot lines are shared, and a lot of the spaces are rear loading. So where you have front porches and sidewalks with your neighbors, you don't have your automobiles parked up front. They're, they're rear loading through an alleyway. So I think it, every bit of this development, um, you know, if it hadn't been for the downturn in 2008. This would have been built out you know, years ago. But, uh, of course, that hit everyone, and now everything's just starting to get back on its feet and, and, and go full steam. So I, I think it's within character of, of the, the original town. And apparently townhomes are a big requested item nowadays because, you see, that's basically what's being built everywhere. I know even over in my district we've got, you know, probably three – five new subdivisions going in as townhomes, if not more. Uh, so apparently, you know, people are at the stage that they don't want to mow their half acre or acre yard, that they, you know, want to live outside that. So I think a lot of young people, and as we age, <laughs> uh, then we don't want to go out and cut the yard and trim the bushes and all that either. So, so I think that is uh, apparently a up and coming very popular item at this time. I think it's an affordability thing, too. I think it's becoming more cost prohibitive to develop and to purchase the properties, and I think the density is, uh, is required in order for the developers to continue with these projects and, and, to, and to bring some supply because there's definitely demand. There's, there's so many people that are moving here and looking for a place to purchase, and there's just not a lot of options right now, which is why we continue to grow. Well, I know a lot about about that area, though, because um, my grandfather had a farm up on that area, too, and uh, I started to think about what um, Councilman Aaron would say about who turns out the lights. If it would have been up to me, I would have liked for it to be no development up there at all. You know, even with my parents and, and that sold their property up there, if it was my way, I told them not to sell their property. But, you know... Back in those days, you couldn't tell your parents what to do and what not to do, you know, because it was up to me. I would like, I remember going up that road one on one because I still go to church up that road and I travel that road all day, every day. I remember when, when there was no traffic up there. I remember when people started um, growing, started building houses, building uh, families. It's, it's a part of, of, of change, you know, but we resist change because we like things to stay just like they were. I mean, even as I remember going up that road as a child, I'd like to still go to church and not meet any cars like we used to do when I was going to church, but that's not realistic, you know. I mean, you can't tell people what, what to and what not to do with, with their property. The most important thing you can do is, is try to manage that growth. And like the mayor says, 
those people that, that live up there in that part of the county are fiercely independent. You start telling them what to do with their property, and you got a problem, boss. I mean, a serious problem, and and they don't they don't take it lightly. You can go up through that and and walk and do yourself a survey, and they'll they'll let you know by the time you get from one end of one on one to four fourteen, they'll let you know how they feel about their property and what they think about you coming to tell them what to do with their property. You know, but that's just that's part of life. But I just think we just need to do the best we can and, and manage that growth and, and do what's right. Other? I think all of us would probably, that have lived in Greer for a long time, would really like for Greer to stay a little Greer as it was. But, you know, I don't think there's, uh, most of the cities that aren't growing are just dying. Uh, and apparently we have a big influx of people moving here from all across the United States, uh, like they had mentioned, for jobs and uh, type of living that we enjoy here. Uh, that some other cities do not, high taxes and all that they have in other states. Uh, so we do have a lot of people moving here. I do real estate myself, and I know, you know, I asked someone the other day at one of the new subdivisions, where are all these people coming from? Because our existing home inventory for sale is very low uh, in the price of the homes that are being built. So, you know, when they're moving here, apparently the building, and you can ride by and you can see they got that building up and people are moving right in so uh, we do have and i think we're fortunate in the growth that we're having and uh, i know like i said everybody would like for it to be the same little old city that it always has been uh, but when we had the big companies with bmw michelin and all that moving into the area and bringing their uh, other uh, companies that uh, provide to them then we just had such a rapid growth in uh, employment. So I think we all need to be grateful for the period of time that we have and for the companies that have come here to give our people uh, employment. So. Interesting fact is not necessarily pertinent to this discussion, but to, to back you up, the Speaker of the House last week, the Medical Association, uh, told us that um, in uh, 2000, there were 4 million people that lived in South Carolina. In the 2020 census, that number will be 5 million. In the next 15 to 17 years, that number will be 6 million. And beyond that, it will probably be even less than 15 years before it's 7 million. So uh, we're the, uh, we are the ninth fastest growing state uh, in, the, in the country right now, and uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, anything um, that, that's going to change that number tremendously. So um, one of the things that I think we all have to be aware of is that uh, there is there is opportunity. There are going to be more people. Uh, we need to be diligent about how we plan and working with other agencies to figure out how we're going to handle traffic and the other things that behooves us. Uh, but we, uh, we, uh, we're cognizant of that and uh, I think have, uh, have done a good job, not only in the past, but uh, the projects that are coming before us. Anybody like that? Anyone else to the conversation at this point? I have a motion in a second. Hearing none. We need to amend the motion. We were amending uh, Exhibit E now. which is the statement of intent and site plan. It's before you. T it's attached to your ordinance now. So the motion was made by. I made the motion. The motion will need to be amended then to amend the uh, statement of intent. Because if it's E and F. I will amend my motion to uh, include the changes with exhibits E and F. And the second was. Just Aaron. I'll amend that. My second on that. I have an amended motion and a second. All clear as to the amendments as proposed by staff. Any further thoughts? Just for clarity, the amendments basically cover the changes that were requested. Yes, sir. My plan. Yes, you got you. Yes, sir. And that's the updated with the, the updated site plan. fewer units and then the addition of the single family. Yes, sir. Okay. Gotcha. Ms. Duncan. Mr. Arrowwood. Yes. Mr. Griffin. Yes. Mr. Hopper. Yes. Mr. Dumas. Yes. Mr. Bettis. Yes. Ms. Albert. Yes. Mayor Danner. Yes. 
Thank you, Mr. McMahon. Uh, we'll move to items in new business. The first is a bid summary regarding the site work, grading, and paving for Kids Planet Playground. Ed Watson will bring us information in regards to that. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Watson, you might want to take just a moment and we'll, uh, we'll let folks leave that want to. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the uh, Council, what you have before you is the bid tabulation for the grading and site work for the, uh, the playground, the common areas, and most of the new parking lot at the uh, lower entrance on the east side of the, uh, the, the Century Park location. This is all for Kids Planet. Uh, Arabi Construction is a, a apparent low bidder. We've checked the references, met with them on site to make sure that they fully understand the scope of work and that their numbers were firm, and we feel good about moving forward with them. What's best since they're the only ones that really have all four wives? I'm sorry, but they have. I said it looks good since they're the one with the lowest bid and they all have wives. Yes. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am, that certainly helps. <clears throat> um, council bid summary uh, information comes to us from staff. Uh, it is to accept the low bid. I want to take a motion to receive. So moved. Second. I have a motion and second. Floor is open for discussion or questions. Is demolition done now? Demolition is 90% complete. We actually spoke with them today. Um, he said they have about two days left. So they have to take uh, the, the shelter down at the lower entrance out and clean up a little bit of, of debris, and then we'll actually schedule a walkthrough with the demolition crew and the awarded uh, grading site contractor to make sure that the site's good before they start. Others? Ms. Duncan? Mr. Earwood? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Battis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Council, uh, Mr. Watson continues to join us for the bid summary and site work grading and paving for the accessible areas at the Kids Planet Playground. Uh, yes, well, thank you. So this is the bid tabulation for the uh, the grading site work for the play. Uh, I mean, for the um, accessible items in this project. This includes the pathways, accessible parking spaces, and the concrete pads for uh, some of the amenities. Uh, this is a separate bid because this is the part of the project that we requested to use. Uh, CDBG dollars through GCRA um, and through Davis Bacon requirements, it has to be handled completely separate. So we're um, we, again, we met with Ravi on site. Uh, we were excited that the apparent low bidder was the same company, so we don't have multiple contractors on site. Recommendation comes with approval by or recommendation comes from staff for um, approval of accepting the low bid. Entertain the motion to receive. So I'm a second. I have a motion and a second. Any additional information or questions, discussion in that regard? Hearing none, Ms. Duncan? Mr. Earwood? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Thank you, sir. We'd like to move to the first and final reading of resolution number 3-2020. This is a resolution certifying certain real property in the city of Greer as an abandoned building site. Mr. Lena Deaton joins us for that conversation. Mayor Council, good evening. Uh, this request comes to you tonight uh, to designate 215 Trade Street. Uh, I refer to it as the old uh, Greer Museum building downtown on Trade Street as an abandoned building for the abandoned building statute to allow developers to seek an income tax <coughs> credit uh, as part of the redevelopment of that property. Uh, in your packet is a copy of the resolution proposed. That resolution has been reviewed and approved by Greer's uh, uh, attorney for economic development matters, Michael Kozlarek. Uh, you'll notice that as exhibits uh, for your policy attached as well includes the notice of intent to rehabilitate that property as well as an affidavit uh, documenting that, that this property does fall within the requirements of the abandoned buildings uh, statute as uh, required by law. Uh, if it will please Mayor and Council, joining me this evening is Sam Boyster with the development group here to answer any questions and address Council as, as you see fit. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, before we proceed then, would you like to share any additional information or, or anything with us at this point? 
Um, no, thank you for having me. Just uh, more excited to rehabilitate one of these great historic buildings at Greer. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, comes with a recommendation from uh, Executive Director of the Greer Development Corp. I'll entertain the motion to receive resolution number 3 2020. So, motion. Second. I have a motion and second. Floor is open for discussion or questions. Your redevelopment plans, do you have an end user? Uh, yes, sir. We have a sweet tea shop, they're a boutique home decor and gift. They're going to be on the first level and then a marketing term is at least the second floor. They're not non profits, are they? They're not. <laughs> 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 Others. <laughs> Ms. Duncan. Mr. Airwood. Yes. Mr. Griffin. Yes. Mr. Hopper. Yes. Mr. Dumas. Yes. Mr. Bettis. Yes. Ms. Albert. Yes. Mayor Dana. Yes. Thank you both. We appreciate your time this evening. <laughs> Now the first and final reading of Resolution 4-2020, this is a resolution adopting the City of Greer Annual Safety Statement. Fire Chief joins us for that discussion. Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, Mayor, uh, members of council. This is an annual uh, uh, resolution adopting our safety uh, statement. There's no changes from last year. Thank you, sir. It comes with a recommendation of staff. Do I hear a motion to receive? So I move. Second. And a second. Floor is open for discussion. Questions? Comments. Here you Ms. Duncan. Mr. Airwood. Yes. Mr. Griffin. Yes. Mr. Hopper. Yes. Mr. Dumas. Yes. Mr. Bettis. Yes. Ms. Albert. Yes. Mayor Dunn. Yes. Council, the first and final reading of Resolution 5-2020 comes to us this evening as well, too. This is a resolution to update the City of Greer Blood born pathogen standard to comply with occupational safety and health administration requirements. Uh, Fire Chief? Yes, sir. Uh, again, there were no updates on this. We do have to go through uh, and, and review the OSHA standards and make sure there's been no updates. Um, that's why I was <coughs> there were no revisions, but they were, there were none needed this year. Comes with a recommendation from staff. Uh, I'm going to take a motion to receive. So moved. Senator. I have a motion and a second. Questions? Comments? Hearing none, Ms. Duncan. Mr. Arrowwood? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Thank you, sir. We have the first reading of ordinance number 1-2020. This is a second supplemental bond ordinance providing for the issuance and sale not exceeding $2.8 million to the City of Greer, South Carolina, accommodations tax and hospitality tax, revenue bond series 2020 and other related matters. Mr. Driggers? Yes, sir. This is a follow-up to an earlier ordinance or an earlier resolution uh, that we passed um, as a uh, reimbursement resolution. And so this is the bond that will provide that reimbursement to us for the purchase and acquisition of the Greer Golf and Country Club. Thank you, sir. I'm going to take a motion to receive. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Floor is open for discussion. Questions? Comments? Hearing none, Ms. Duncan? Mr. Arrowwood? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. We have the first reading of ordinance number 2 2020. This is an ordinance to change the zoning classification of property owned by Professional Pharmacy of Greer, located on Sunnyside Drive from C2 Commercial to RM1, which is residential multifamily. Um, information uh, from Mr. McNahan. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is a rezoning request for a portion of a parcel located on Sunnyside Drive. It is currently C2, and they are requesting RM1 zoning for a future development. This is the property in question. It's highlighted in red there at the corner of Arlington and Sunnyside. It's kind of hard to see the blue line. You'll be see it better on this picture here. This is the current zoning of the property. As you see, the RM2, which is kind of the darker brown section, is currently being developed with single-family homes in that area. And the organization is basically wanting to expand that over to this side. This is the future land use map. This is residential land use three. And 
this is the survey. It's just a clear picture of how it's actually going to look once it is everything is completed and reported. And this is the current street view of the property. Um, Planning Commission did hold a public hearing on November 18th and recommended approval of the rezoning request. That's all the information I have at this time, but we'll be happy to answer any questions. Purpose of discussion on the same motion to receive first reading of ordinance number 2 2020. So moved. Second. The motion is second. The floor is open for discussion or questions. Comment? Are there any plans for that corner lot there? It's going to remain commercial. We haven't heard anything about it being redeveloped at this time. Others? I'm really glad to see this. I mean, it cleans that corner up, and um, out of all of the, you know, we, we've got we've got subdivisions that just about all of them are benefiting from all of the growth, um, and, and it, it's being, it's good growth. It's not uh, it, it's not anything that's going to be a detriment to the city. We have one neighborhood that I think we need to be focusing on, and, and that is. And that's affordable housing too for, for that area. Yep. Good project. Others. Hearing on Ms. Duncan. Mr. Airwood. Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dennis? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Council will move to the first reading of ordinance number 3 2020. This is an ordinance to change the zoning classification of property owned by Pierce Properties LLC located on Brushy Creek Road from DRD to C2. Uh, information from Mr. McMahon. Yes, sir. This originally came before you back in 2017 as a DRD request for pups and pints. Um, unfortunately, the developer was not able to complete that project, and the property owner is requesting to rezone it back to C2, which it was. This is the current aerial view of the property. It is at the corner of Kings Creek. Um, it's Carmen Glen subdivision and on Brush Creek. This is the current zoning. It will be right next to the dialysis <coughs> line. Here's the future land use, residential land use three along the neighborhood corridor. And just another aerial picture for you there. Um, Planning Commission held a public hearing on November 18th and made a recommendation of approval. That's all the information I have at this time, but we have to answer any questions you may have. For the purpose of discussion, I'll have a motion to receive ordinance number 3 2020. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Floor is open for discussion. Is there any plans uh, for the development of that property at this time, or is it? Right now, I believe they're just trying to market it. It's easier for them to market as C2 than DRD. They've had a couple of people want to buy the property, but uh -huh. when they see that it's DRD, it's very strict on what they can do. And they it was originally commercial. Is yes, ma'am. It was originally commercial. So just going back to its original so yes, at this time. With no actual, just trying to market it, like you said, not no actual buyer at this time. Yes, ma'am. Others? Hearing none, Ms. Duncan. Mr. Arrowwood? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bettis? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Danner? Yes. Council, it appears that we have one item for executive session. I'll um, entertain that that be taken up. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to enter into executive session to discuss an economic development matter pertaining to Project Homecoming as allowed by state statute section 30-470A5. That comes as a motion to hear a second. Second. Any questions or discussion in that regard? Hearing none, Ms. Duncan. Mr. Arrowwood? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dumas? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Banner? Yes. Council and executive session we consider one economic development matter. Uh, that pertained to um, Project Homecoming as allowed by State Statute 30-4-70A5. Uh, we've taken no action in that regard. Do I hear a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. I have a motion to second. Ms. Duncan? 
Mr. Arrowwood? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Albert? Yes. Mayor Bannon? Yes. Stand adjourned.